participants in the symposium, distinguished guests. May I welcome you again on behalf of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities to this event. We have organized the symposium on Ottoman law and society to commemorate the untimely death of Professor Haidt, who passed away prematurely on May 13, 1968. Many of the speakers before me have emphasized that Professor Haidt established the Ottoman studies in Israel and himself made a substantial contribution to this field. I would like to add to this that he also expanded the scope of Islamic studies in, at the Hebrew University much beyond the Middle East, including in them for the first time uh, Islam in um, the Indian subcon subcontinent and in Africa. So we thought it appropriate to dedicate this scholarly event to his memory. Before I introduce our first speaker, I would like to thank my colleagues on the steering committee, Professor Amnon Cohen, who is with us here, Professor Amy Zinger, who is also the president of the Ottoman Turkish Studies Association, and Dr. Avi Rubin from Ben Gurion University in the Negev for their dedication to this task, without which this event would not have come about. The first speaker in this session will be Professor David Head. Professor David Head is Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the Hebrew University. His main research fields are ethics, political philosophy, and bioethics. Among other subjects, he studied supererogation, or actions beyond the call of duty, toleration, and intergenerational justice. He has also been involved in the public sphere, mainly in participating in numerous commissions on the regulation of the ethical and legal aspects of new medical practices and technologies. In 2017, he was awarded the Emet Prize in philosophy. As one of Uriel had three children, he will address, address us on a personal note. Please. Good evening. Uh, we academics are familiar with fest shrifts and conferences in memory of a colleague. They are proper tribute to the diseased person and to his or her scientific work. Such in memoriam conferences are organized once, usually once or twice, but usually not beyond the time span of a decade or a little more since the death of the scholar. This is why I was astounded already 10 years ago when Professor Johann Friedman approached me with the idea of holding a one-day workshop on the 40th anniversary of my father's death. It was a moving gesture as well as a successful workshop of mainly young Israeli scholars. So as you can imagine, how touched I was when in a cursory meeting at the opera, uh, about two and a half years ago, Yohanan told me, I quote, that he was aware that the year 2018 was approaching and that he hopes to be around at that time so as to do a 50th anniversary conference, this time an international event. In my long life as an academic myself, I've never encountered such a long-term memory and personal commitment. So first of all, I'm happy that Johannes is with us, alive and kicking. And secondly, on behalf of myself and my sister Ofra and our families, including the family of our late brother Michael, I wish to express our deep appreciation for Yohanan's relentless effort in putting up this gathering, both on the academic and the organizational level. Yet I can try to explain this exceptional celebration of a scholar who has now been dead for half a century. First, and here I have only indirect evidence, his research was pioneering and had a long-lasting value. Only last year, 
I was approached by a publisher in Istanbul who wishes to translate Uriel Hayd's first book on Zia Gökalp into Turkish. In universities abroad, upon being introduced by my family name, I'm often asked, are you the son of, by people who are much too young to have personally known my father. I also see from time to time that his books still appear on the reading lists of a university courses on Ottoman history around the world. From our experience, 60 years is a long shelf life for a book. Secondly, and here I have a direct evidence, Uriel Haid, with all his administrative responsibilities and intensive research schedule, had always time for his graduate students. As an adolescent, I saw them coming and going in our home for long meetings, conversations, and for a weekly seminar. I remember the table talks in which my uh, father was telling my mother about his plans for directing his students to particular areas of expertise and helping them get scholarships for studying abroad. He was proud in what is now called placement record. Only when I became myself a university professor, I realized how rare such loyalty to graduate students is. But with his commitment to research career of his young students, Haid was also able to expand the institution which, was, which he directed. Becoming the head of the Institute for Oriental Studies in the late 50s, he not only changed the name of the institute into the Institute for Asian and African Studies, which was quite a revolutionary move at the time, but also took practical steps in uh, directing promising graduate students to specialize in new fields of research, such as Islam in Africa and in India, as well as Far Eastern history and languages. Like all his colleagues at the time, Uriel Hay defined himself as an Orientalist. Unlike the English term, the Hebrew parallel is still considered politically correct, if I'm not mistaken. We can say Mizrahan, while Orientalist has a bad connotation. Uh, but his approach to the, the subjects of his research was far from being Orientalist in Edward Said's sense. Actually, he was explicit in his inauguration lecture upon taking the university position in 1952 in his conviction that Middle Eastern studies at the Hebrew University can, in, in, in his words, and I translate from the Hebrew original, teach us to avoid the condescending attitude that characterized many Western scholars towards the native, quote unquote, Oriental, who is backward in his technical knowledge and organizational skills. Such an attitude, he continues, is not only morally disgraceful, but foolish from the point of view of our, namely Israeli, future in this region. We must educate ourselves to carry out our research with intellectual honesty and maximal objectivity without being swept by emotions or prejudice." End of quote. And he ends that lecture with the declaration that a historian is not only required to be committed to a scientific approach, but must be able to feel empathy to the subject of his research. And to quote him again, such history may be able to serve us as what the French call école de générosité, the training of the mind to the understanding of the other among the nations. These are words of a true humanist. But Haid was also an old style historian. Although coming to the university from the diplomatic career and being a very political person himself, he was suspicious of the growing tendency of the direct use of historical knowledge in the service of policy making and warned against the broad blurring of the borderline between the scientific historian uh, on the one hand and the political analyst or journalist on the other. 
Uh, he followed Mark Bloch, the famous historian, in calling for the resistance of the temptation to make quick evaluations, a temptation which historians of the contemporary period are always susceptible. This explains why he only very rarely appeared in the media commenting on public affairs. A rare recording of a short radio interview in the early 1960s in which he was called to explain the heated dispute between the Greeks and the Turks in Cyprus. I can still hear today how cautious he was in avoiding the expression of any political position on the matter. Nevertheless, no historian can, be completely, can completely maintain full detachment from the object of his research. Haidt's very choice of the history of the languages of the Middle East was directly motivated by his immigration at the age of 21 as a student. In Germany, he completed two years of law and economics, probably preparing himself to joining his family business in Köln. But upon arrival in Palestine in 1934, he switched to Oriental studies because he felt that recognizing the culture of the new place was part of his Zionist commitment. And it is no coincidence, I believe, that uh, his doctor, for his doctoral thesis, he chose the subject of the emergence of Turkish nationalism, which in many ways runs parallel to that of Jewish uh, nationalism, nationalism, which has taken shape uh, uh, along the same historical lines in many respects. Furthermore, and in this case more explicitly, his early book on language reform in modern Turkey manifested his deep interested interest in the analogical and contemporaneous reform in modern Turkey um, Revival, sorry, in um, the process of the revival of modern Hebrew and modern Turkish. For similar reasons, Haid uh, was driven throughout his research career to study the Ottoman rule of Palestine as part of the history of the land in which he chose to live and revive. But I would like to end my short remarks with two cases in which, ironically, Haid's studies became one might say, against his will, relevant in a way that historians would be proud of. In an article from 1963 on the 1906 crisis relating to the borderline between the British-controlled Sinai Peninsula and the Turkish-ruled uh, Palestine, he was first to describe the events from the Turkish rather than the English point of view. He also drew a map of the agreed borders from Rafah to the Gulf of Aqaba, or today Elat. The focus of that crisis was a small sea resort called Taba, which became a serious contested issue between Israel and Egypt in 1989, threatening the peace accords between the two countries. I was, I was approached at that time by the legal advisor of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, to provide them with a copy of my father's article. Unfortunately for Israel, the article proved that Taba belongs to Egypt. <laughs> the second case is less anecdotal and proves Uel Haid's power of almost prognostication which, of course, he would have shrugged off as having nothing to do with the work of his historian. In his very last public le lecture delivered at his nomination to the newly established Eliyahu Elet Elat Chair at the Hebrew University and published posthumously, he speaks of the revival of Islam in modern Turkey, which is also the title of the article. He says there in 1968, I quote, True, the moderniza modernization of Turkish society is making progress, and left-wing tendencies are becoming more conspicuous, especially among young intellectuals. But, as often is the case in Turkish history, a countercurrent is gathering strength. This survival, in, if my interpretation is correct, revival of Islam in Turkey, the most secular of all Muslim countries, are obviously a fact of great significance to the future of Islam in the modern world. 
end of quotes. For me, of course, Uriel Haid was first and foremost a father, a family man. Although as a gymnasium student in Germany in the 1920s, he received a solid philosophical education, he was a bit suspicious of my own leanings towards philosophy. As you all know from his writings, he had a down-to-earth approach to historical facts and a systematically avoided speculation. Much of his work focused, was focused on institution, politics, and power. But having reread now his first book on Zia Gekalb, I noticed that at least at that very early stage in his career, he was still very much interested in intellectual history and the power of ideas in the formation of historical processes. A kind of history that my late brother, Michael, has adopted as an early modern historian of Europe. But despite not having followed his first footsteps in his discipline, my father has continuously served for me as an exemplary, exemplary guide in the virtues of any academic pursuit. Integrity, accuracy, responsibility, and curiosity. Although I could never match his broad education, knowledge of languages, and impressive productivity. It's time now to thank all of you who helped Yohanan in designing and organizing this conference uh, for Avi Rubin and uh, Amy Singer and Professor Amnon Cohen, whom I remember both as my father's student and my own private teacher of Arabic. Members of the, um, the Israel Academy, of course, um, uh, is, deserves all our uh, uh, thanks for the this generous hosting and supporting of this conference, and of course, all the participants and uh, attendants. Thank you very much. <laughs>